So first of all, before we uh, talk about what happened after 1917, it's, it's probably good to have a look at what happened before it. And the period between 1910 and 1914 was a period really of unprecedented strikes in Britain and strikes that spread right across different industries and uh, what people would call mass strikes. And uh, a big uh, fan of these was Rosa Luxemburg herself, uh, who said that this, this was a universal form of proletarian struggle that was taking part right across Europe at the time. So these strikes were uh, in the coal fields up in Durham. And the, the other thing which was striking about the nature of these, these uh, manifestations was that the official trade unions weren't in control of them. You had bodies setting up of rank-and-file shops, church committees. Uh, forgive me, because I'm a trade union uh, full-timer myself, so it <laughs> kind of sounds a bit hypocritical, but uh, these were far more effective than the actual uh, official trade unions in conducting the disputes. And even at this time, we had uh, 1913, for example, we had 11 million strike days in Britain. So that was the build-up to the war period. In 1914, just before the war, there was a triple alliance which took place. And people were saying that that was the uh, the steel workers, uh, the transport workers, mainly the railway workers, and the coal miners. And uh, people were saying this was a great advance in uh, working class history. Well, that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it was, and uh, commentators from the left have said, it was a government trying to regain control for the trade union bureaucracies of the mass movement that was going on. So these people were fighting for very kind of basic demands in a way. Eight hour, eight hour day, 40 hour a week, free education, housing. Uh, they wanted decent housing. I don't think the concept of council housing was then uh, up there, but they were looking for, I suppose, what we'd call social housing at affordable prices and the abolition of slums. But the interesting part as well is what was happening in Ireland, of course, uh, I don't want to take complete, uh, I don't want, to, don't want Ireland to take complete credit for the 1917 revolution, but uh, in 1916 we had our own attempt at a revolution in Ireland, uh, led by James Connolly, and no less than Lenin himself said that, uh, Con- uh, remarked on the, the class nature of the, the rising in Ireland, and it went on to form part of his reasoning uh, about self-determination for the Soviet republics, where, all, where other Bolsheviks, even other Bolsheviks, were dismissing it as some sort of petty bourgeois uprising. Uh, Lenin saw further than that, saw the nature of the forces involved, especially James Connolly's Irish Citizens' Army, uh, who were definitely of a left-wing nature, and that went on to influence Soviet policy. Well, during the war period, uh, there was a basically a massive fall in the, in, in, in the strike wave. And that was because of two reasons, really. First of all, government oppression. People could be done for sedition for trying to uh, organise strikes. And secondly, the abject uh, capitulation of the trade union bureaucracy during that period to the government's plan. And uh, they were advocating actually doing tours of workplaces, talking down strikes, uh, trying to get people to go back to work where strikes occurred. And that saw a massive fall-off in the number of people that were taking strike action. So obviously 1917 came, and that changed the picture completely. What we were talking about now in some cases wasn't just reformist demands, wasn't the 40-hour week, but who would actually control the, the country? Who, who would, which class would be running the country and in charge of the means of production and distribution? And there were, uh, after 1917, large elements of people coming back from the war who were influenced by Bolshevik propaganda and in no uncertain terms were not prepared to put up with what they had been put up with before the war. And I think the government, even the Liberal government of uh, Lloyd George, people like that, they recognised that there would have to be concessions Mm -hmm. made or there was going to be a revolution, or at least the potential of a revolution in Britain. And that's why they came up with a kind of proto- uh, working uh, welfare state and I'd, I'd, I'd say the, the origins of welfare state probably go back to there or the theory behind it, welfareism uh, go back to that period because they were actually afraid the people coming back from the war who had been military trained 
had the capacity to have a revolution in Britain. So if we look back at uh, some of the things that happened in that period, and just after that period, in, in 1918, we had uh, 12,000 coppers go on strike in London, and that was out of a force of 19,000. And the Prime Minister of it, they said, we've never been closer to Bolshevism in Britain. That was the, that was the response of the Prime Minister. We also had military uprisings or mutinies, because Churchill wanted to send troops to smash the Soviet government in Russia. He wanted to send conscripted troops from Britain over to Russia uh, to smash what they saw as a system that challenged the very nature of what they had over here. And the, this resulted in over 90 mutinies in Britain, some big, some small. But at, at, its, at its height, it uh, involved about 100,000 different troops. So you can imagine that. 100,000 troops in Britain saying that they're not going to take part uh, in going out and smashing the Soviet Union. Some of the... Uh, in East Kilbride, for example, the, one of the, one of the uh, ships, they raised the red flag. Sailors raised the red flag and declared a commune upon the ship. This is a British Navy vessel. And uh, these, these people are facing hanging, by the way, from mutiny. But that's what they did. Uh, but seeing the situation, even Churchill, who was a, a warmonger, said that we can't, we can't hang these people because we can't, we can't understand the effect it's going to have on everybody else. So they didn't hang them. Uh, also in Archangel, we had a whole regiment, a uh, Yorkshire regiment, who also set up a worker Soviets because they didn't want to fight. The, this was in Russia, Archangel, of course. Uh, they didn't want to fight the Reds in the revolution. So this was a very, very dangerous time if you were a member of the British ruling class. So after the war, these, we had a massive increase in the number of uh, people joining trade unions. By 1921, it had nearly doubled. Uh, but there was also mass unemployment because people were getting demobilised from the army. And some of the strikes, um, I've mentioned before what, what they were, but some of the strikes were a little bit reactionary in nature because, because of male unemployment, we had the situation where people were coming back from the war and they would be seeing women uh, who'd actually taken their jobs or maybe black people or Asian people haven't taken their jobs. And I'm ashamed to say that this actually uh, resulted in some places in Lynchens in Cardiff and Liverpool uh, where people were, were hounded out of a job and the government actually repatriated 600 people. So it wasn't all good. It wasn't all good. But we had this strange kind of coalition where these reactionary strikes, we would have this uh, racism and sexism. At the same time, we would have left-wing elements in there fighting for progressive programmes. So this strike wave that took place uh, was, was of a mixed nature, but by and large progressive. But we, sh we shouldn't try to hide, in my opinion, uh, the bad parts of it as well. So, in the end, by... 1920, there was 3,708 people uh, mm -hmm. in trade unions. Sorry, 3 million, uh, 708,000. 3,000 isn't a lot now. But uh, they were in, in trade unions, and these trade unions were becoming uh, more and more militant. The, the aims, again, after the, after the war, um, and when we were in the period of this, uh, this massive strike wave, we had millions and millions of days. In 1913, we had 11 million days of strike action. Uh, 1914, we had not. Uh, during the war, it, it, it dipped their low. And then we go back to 1918, 1919, and we're back in the millions again. We're back in the millions of days taken for strike action. And again, just like before the war, we had, after the war, the nature of the strikes that were taking place were led by rank-and-file workers' committees. The, at a parallel time, we have, uh, and it can't be ignored, the rise of the Parliamentary Labour Party. Um, in, in Clydeside, we had a very sort of uh, mixed bag, and we hear, hear about Red Clydeside, Red Clydeside. We had, on the one hand, people like John McLean, who wanted outright revolution. And we had uh, uh, Willie Gallagher actually came from there as well, uh, first, one of the first communist MPs. 
ended up in Parliament. And we also had people who, who were, just, were just there to become part of even the lefts of a, a kind of reformist Labour Party government. And we had people from Clydeside and indeed all the industrial areas becoming Labour MPs and taking the parliamentary route forward. The strike wave was uh, eventually curved, and it was curved through concessions. Uh, they were given out uh, the the 40-hour week. Uh, moves, moves were made towards that, especially in, in engineering, where they were suffering a 53-hour week. It was massively reduced. Uh, the government then tried to go on a counter-offensive and smash uh, the, the demand for equal wages and cut wages even. And there was a strike wave against that in engineering coal and in steel, and they managed to fight that off, and not only fight it off, but they gained, uh, they gained more concessions for people on lower wages. They actually got their wages increased. So the trade union bureaucracy in the Labour Party couldn't have this going on. Um, they, met, they met Lloyd George, and Lloyd George actually said, look, there's two possibilities here. One, the state rules. Or two, there's a force which is more powerful in the state, within the state, which is going to take over. And I said to the trade union leaders, are you prepared uh, to be that force? Are you prepared to take on those responsibilities? And basically, they completely bottled it and said that they weren't and went about demobilising the strike wave. So I want to round up where the sort of lessons for today. We've got, uh, we've got Jeremy Corbyn. And I mean, if we look at the... Well, look, look at the demands back then. 40-hour week. I wish everybody on the railway could do a 40-hour week. Nationalisation of industry. Well, Corbyn's given that guarantee he's going to renationalise the railways. And I hope he extends that to the, the, all the utilities, and I hope it takes it far, far further than that as well. I think that um, one thing that Corbyn has done is revived, I think, the, the spirit of, if not revolutionary, reform of socialism within the Labour Party. And for that reason, he's worth supporting. We, we as a union, uh, railway workers and transport workers, we were partly founding of the Labour Party and we walked away from it uh, in the early 2000s because it was no longer a party that represented our interests. It was a neoliberal party and we thought uh, working class people would be represented by a new workers party. That was the view of my trade union and indeed myself. I think no one saw Corbyn coming up, no one saw... Uh, the revival within the Labour Party. It was, it was kind of treated as a, an annoying irritant who maybe round up a few left-wing votes for the mainstream of the party. And he's proved that all wrong. I think he will be Prime Minister. But I think the, the point is, when he becomes Prime Minister, which forces will he be actually listening to and which forces will be influential in forming the Corbyn policy? And if we leave it to that den of iniquity down the road, the Trade Union Congress, I'll tell you what, we'll look back and we'll see the sellouts that happened after 1917. And those same sellouts will be repeated. Because that Trade Union Congress, I don't know what they're there for. I mean, I, I know that uh, it's, it's, of course, sort of a machine for lordships and ladyships and service to, services to British capitalism. I don't know what else they do, to be quite honest. But there's another, and uh, more, more important, in my view, pressure on Corgan. That comes from the working class, the organised working class, and militant trade unions, and indeed in bodies like this. And I think uh, the real legacy of 1917 is the fact that workers are still in militant organisations. And our union is not the only union. We're not just a jobs club. If you look at the rule one of our rule book, subsection four, it says we're there to replace capitalism with a socialist form of society. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're about. And that's a demand we'll be making on Jeremy Corbyn. We don't want this and that. We don't want minor concessions. We want capitalism replaced with a socialist form of society. Thanks very much. Hi. Um, yeah, so as Ben said, I'm a teacher and I work in quite a deprived inner city school in Sheffield. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the effect that cuts have had on education and what we should be doing about that. Um, as many of you will probably know, teachers work insanely long hours. Uh, for high school, the average is about 55 hours a week, and in primaries, it's 60 hours a week. And in that time, teachers are carrying out more jobs than they ever have done before. In addition to planning lessons and marking books, the kind of traditional roles that you'd expect, because of the sacking of teaching assistants and many other support staff in schools, teachers now take on a lot of different support roles, trying to teach in a mainstream classroom, 
students with incredibly high st- uh, special educational needs, and students who are new to English that have literally been in the country maybe a couple of weeks at a time. Um, and on top of this, uh, caretakers and premises staff have also been sacked, so we're taking on additional roles in terms of looking after the buildings, setting up events, and that's not just for people in school, that's for any external events the schools are putting on to rake in a bit more money. Um, and on top of this, we're expected to fulfil our wider responsibilities to the school, which is actually a clause in the teaching contract that requires you to carry out additional tasks, um, not stated that you're not paid for, so you're carrying out additional work on top of that. And this is really uh, putting on extracurricular activities, clubs and things, which is necessary <coughs> to plug the gaps that's left by the woeful um, national curriculum that goes had a hand in implementing And in addition to all of these uh, stresses on teachers, the pay of teachers is often directly linked to the results of the students that they teach. Um, And our appraisals are linked, as I said, to how much additional work you do, so above and beyond the duties that you're actually paid for. What extra are you doing to this school to determine whether or not you deserve your pay rise or not? Um, And there was actually a clause in the teaching contract, which I discovered once I became a rep for the NEU, that states that a teacher is expected to work as many additional hours as necessary in order to get the job done. (laughs) Um, This is being stretched way beyond the imagination, and the goodwill of teachers is really being put to the test. Um, I think the effect that this is having on teachers is palpable. Um, There's huge numbers of teachers off on sick with stress, and I mentioned this statistic this morning, but I think it's worth repeating. The Nashua um, Trade Union and the Teaching Union did a, um, a survey of a certain number of people a couple of years ago, teaching staff, and they discovered that just under half of them had not just had stress or experienced stress, but had actually had to seek medical help um, to help them cope with that stress. And this is, I think that's an outrageous figure, um, that it's just becoming a normal, commonplace part of teaching. And it's ridiculous, it's compounded by further cost-cutting measures as well. So schools don't want to pay for cover, and teachers are often pressured into coming in when they feel sick. Um, My boss in particular likes to ask you, well, could you make it in for 12? Um, And horrifically, on Wednesday, I had to drive a pregnant colleague to the hospital in the morning who had come into work crippled over in pain, sobbing, because she was too afraid and too worried to ask for another day off work because she'd already had a couple of days off due to her pregnancy. This is the reality in teaching. It's not exaggerated in any way. This is the day-to-day life of many teachers. And the effect that it has on the kids is horrendous as well. I've already mentioned that special educational needs students just aren't getting the support that they need because the government refused to fund uh, special educational needs departments correctly. Um, But basic things just aren't happening in schools. We don't have pens and paper. Um, Some schools, I think around the Nottingham area, even sent a letter out to parents saying, oh, could uh, could you set up some direct debit so you can help us pay for basic things that we need in schools? This is something that the state should be providing for people. And it's just not happening Um, And I think cuts elsewhere that you might not think are directly affecting teaching are having a big impact. For example, cuts to um, public transport and things means that some children are now having to walk up to an hour to school. There's a child in my form who walks an hour in the morning every day to get to school and an hour back again. Um, So children are genuinely suffering, as are teachers. And I think it begs the question, what are the government doing about this? What, What do they say? Well, Theresa May is adamant that they are funding education. She says that there's more money in education now than there ever has been in the past. And physically, that's true. Of course, that's true. There are more children. You need more funding to pay for those children. And of course, as inflation goes up, more money is there. So compared to like 50 years ago, yeah, there is more money in education. But that doesn't mean that it in any way covers the costs of what is needed. Um, As I've outlined, like even pens and paper is is difficult to afford in schools right now. Um, And so... Teachers are kind of filling in for this. They're um, buying resources out of their own pockets. They're working for longer hours. They're working harder. And they're working for less money than they ever had done before. And the reality of the situation is, is appalling. Um, and cuts to education have stretched our schools literally to breaking point, um, as far as the majority of people in education can see. And the government claims that there's no magic money tree. Well, apparently not when it comes to funding things like education, uh, health, pay and protection for the vulnerable. And it's no wonder when they're spending it on propping up their weak government in payouts to the DUP. The truth is, though, that there is plenty of money in society. As we talked about uh, this morning, as we know uh, through looking at economics, thank you, um, there is enough money to give everyone a decent education, to be taught by properly trained professionals um, who work in decent conditions and in schools that are fit to be uh, studied in. The problem is, though, that it's concentrated in the hands of the bosses and of big corporations um, who are refusing 
um, to invest. They're refusing to um, put this money into use in a way that it could be used by the state. They won't invest because they don't expect a big enough profit in return. And this is the despicable reality behind the claim that they don't have any money. They don't have money for us. Um, and unless, really, we build a society um, based on the needs of all and not just on the profits of um, an ever-growing profits in the pockets of the um, exploiters, the crisis in education and, and in all other sectors as well that everyone will be well aware of is only going to get worse, it will only deepen. Teachers are going to continue to leave the profession in droves, feeling infantilised by the system, feeling depressed, exhausted, stressed and patronised and ultimately it's children, it's the future working class who are suffering the most. Um, and Corbyn's uh, National Education Service um, proposes increasing taxes um, on the rich, but also um, b bringing back VAT onto private health care, which is exempt from it at this moment in time. But if we want to achieve a decent education for everyone, we need to do far more than that. Um, we need to take back what has been robbed from us um, for decades as a working class. We need to nationalise the banks and use the wealth of society to democratically plan our economy so that it benefits everybody. Teachers and parents are the people who know how to run schools. We're in that system every single day. We know how to work. We know what is needed. Um, and we also know what the curriculum should look like. We know what money should be spent on. Um, and so rather than people who have not set foot in a classroom since they graduated making massive decisions, a, a, an old boss of mine at an old school used to um, just be a manager in a different corporation and he apparently has the transferable skills to know what we should be teaching our children. Um, we actually should have democratic grassroots control, decisions made by working people for working people. And that means that we, and by that I mean teachers, students in the system, parents, workers who have had any stake in education at any point in their life, so everybody, <coughs> need to get active with our anger and our frustration with the system. Um, teachers are actually quite well unionised, um, but what is needed is the will to fight, and that has to come from leadership, but also from the general members um, of our trade union, taking strike action to show the government and to show the heads of our academies that it is us who run the schools, and it is us who educate the young minds of this country. And we have had enough of 60, 50, 70 hour weeks, we've had enough of pay freezes, and we've had enough that, to, of cuts that mean the children that come to our schools come to us tired, sleep deprived, hungry and dirty, we need change now, we need investment now, and if the system that we live within won't afford or refuses to give us the money to change that system, then we need to smash that system. Workers need to organise and we need to fight in our trade unions, and we need your support, the support of workers in every other union, the support of parents and children, like I've already mentioned. And we need the support of those who understand that it isn't just this government, but it is capitalism that's to blame for the mess that our education system is in. Teachers always get quite a bad rep for striking because it means that loads of people are affected by it. They have to, the parents have to take days off work. Um, people get very angry about this because it causes a lot of disruption. Well, good. That is exactly what we want. We want as much disruption as possible from our strikes. Um, and this is basically the only thing that we have to show that um, you know we are the people who control the system. And by withholding our labour, um, it, it causes more than just the teaching profession to come to a standstill. And it raises that vital question of who really runs society. And when the answer becomes clear that it, it's us, it's the working class, we can then begin to bring an end to capitalism and bring a start to a socialist society that will allow equal opportunity for all, decent wages, and most importantly, decent education for everyone, forever. Thank you. Uh, greetings from the Republic of Yorkshire. Uh, which is bigger in population than Scotland or Denmark. Uh, we don't want any independence. Um, I remember having a conversation with my great-grandma in 1973 uh, about my great-granddad. And she said, uh, he, uh, did he ever go abroad to the seaside? He said, he only ever went abroad once. He said he went to fight in the Boer War in 1899. I said, and how old were he? He said, 13. He said, well, yeah. I said, it must have been a massive thing going to fight in the Boer War and leaving school at that age. And she looked at him and gone out and she said, Paul had been down the pit since he was eight. And, and, and whereas that's funny, it's not funny, is it? Because when you grow up post-war, you actually think what existed post-war has always existed because that's what's in your consciousness. But the reality of life is that in 1913 in Britain, the two biggest occupations were, most people guess the first one, the biggest occupation for men was coal mining. There was a million coal miners in Britain. But the biggest occupation for women, and there was 1.3 million people doing it, and people very rarely guess what the answer is, was domestic service. 
And, and that is the reality. Like my grandma left Surrey, Croydon in Surrey, in 1913 to be a servant in Doncaster, and she never saw her mother again. She got one day a year off on Mothering Sunday to remember her mother, who could possibly get to Croydon and back in the, in the same day. And I think people need to know where we've come from to know where we're going. In 1963, I said to my great grandma, I, I came over and said, We need to pray for Churchill tonight. And she said, Why? She said, Because he's very poorly. And she said, he's not as poor as he would be if I could get my hands on him. <laughs> and that's a political education. That is a real education, because I had believed things I'd been told. And the last lesson I had at school, on the 3rd of July, 1973, and people of my age in any Labour Party in Britain will tell you this is true. A lot of people think it's exaggerated, but it's not. I was told that the biggest problems, this is by a Labour councillor in social studies, the biggest problems in Britain by the year 2000 will be we'll work in a five-hour week because of technology, we'll have free electricity because of nuclear power, we'll have free petrol because of North Sea oil, and the motorways will be used for um, cycling because we'll all be on free public transport. Now, people, I, I went to school with a lad who were terrified. He didn't know what he was going to do for the rest of the week when he'd done his five hours on a Monday. <laughs> and that's the truth. But the defining part of the 20th century in Britain was the 1984 five minor strike. Because at that time, the ruling class said they're not having them benefits. There's a financial crisis that had come in 77, 78, the IMF crisis. You're not having them benefits anymore. And we had the 84 five minor strike, and we saw what people did. And that's carried on. People haven't forgotten 84 five, particularly in the areas where it affected them. And it's such that the Prime Minister, who thought she'd won the Falklands War, who thought she'd won the minor strike, who was their greatest leader post-Churchill, they can't build the statue to her anywhere in Britain because they can't afford the security around the statue. <laughs> that is the truth. That's what the official position is. And the Financial Times said yesterday that 24 million people in Britain are financially vulnerable. That means at some point in the next three months something could happen to them where they will be in a situation where they can't afford to live. And 4 million people between 25 and 40 are in such a situation that at least once in the last six months they've gone without food because they can't afford to pay bills. And that's the reality of the system we're in at this moment in time. And I often, when I'm arguing with people, refuse to argue on their terms. When they say there's too many people on benefits, I agree with that. And I say let's get Prince Charles to work. <laughs> and, and it's saying the endless stories about terrorism there is a real problem but what about the terrorism on the 24 million people who think they can't afford to eat the 4 million people who can't, that's the people who are waiting an hour on the phone to ring about universal credit that is a form of state terrorism that's terrorising every person in Britain at this moment in time and the fact of the matter is YouGov who did a really good analysis on the last two general elections went round and did two more questions one of the questions was, how many people think in Britain that their lives will, in, will improve under capitalism in the next five years? 15%. And somebody said it on the television the other day, I think it was James Bryan, I can't remember. He says, the problem with capitalism at the moment is you want people to live under it, but you're not giving people any capital. That's the problem. That's what's in their heads. And I don't want to talk about statistics too much, because the worst statistic I've ever seen was the other week where 15% of voters thought that Theresa May gave a good speech at Tory party conference. <laughs> now, there's obviously 15% of people going to vote yes for absolutely anything. So let's keep away from statistics. But what's interesting is, according to the, the editorial in the Financial Times last week, Theresa May is worried that Philip Hammond is too wooden and doesn't appeal, appeal to the electorate. Theresa May thinks that. <laughs> We've got a situation now where, and I said this to people before the general election, it's all right making fun of Jeremy Corbyn in Parliament in front of a situation where 80% of his own MPs are at his back and you've got 350 public school boys and girls laughing at your jokes and you're paying somebody £100,000 a year to write your script. That's easy to do. That's just entertainment in the city varieties. But I tell you what, 
going and addressing 100 coal miners or 100 school dinner staff or 100 bin workers. You can't kid them. So when she stands up in front of somebody when she's going around Britain and talks about real issues, she can't cut it. It's not because she's deteriorated. She's just the same as she is in Parliament, but there's just paid monkeys listening to what she's doing there. <laughs> now, I voted out in the European election. I'm neither for nor in the EU. We're in real trouble whether we're in or out. I voted out because I wanted to cause the Tories as big a problem as they could have. <laughs> and let's be absolutely clear, sometimes you have to appeal to Napoleon's maxim. If my opponents are in the middle of a, a mistake, I make a point of not interrupting them. <laughs> and that is what the EU is about. It's their argument with each other about the future of Britain. And we're in a situation now where at our national executive meeting in April 2016, I made a speech about the EU when we were told that all the opinion polls were showing that it was 60% to 40% in favour of stopping it. This is only two months before the referendum. I said, I don't know who you're talking to, but it's going to be out. It's absolutely definitely going to be out. And Cameron's going to be gone within three weeks. There's no way, because Cameron will get replaced by Osborne. Osborne will go with Cameron. It's absolutely obvious that that's what's going to happen. And there'll be an outvote. And it, you're a fantasist. I was accused of being a fantasist. That sort of fantasy, I call, is being able to work out what's going on. So when I went to the next NEC meeting, they had a right go at me and said, well, you've got your wish now. When do you think we're coming out? I says, I never thought we were coming out. I never said we were coming out. I said we'd vote out. But I've got the Don Henley and the Eagles view of life. You can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. <laughs> and that's what's going on at this moment. And I've also got a view on the Corbyn election as leader that isn't held by many on the left. But I think some people on the left are too nice when they're analysing what the right wing are up to. People are saying, oh, they were kind to Corbyn letting him on the ballot paper. They saw that it were only fair that he should be on the ballot paper. Wow, a load of rubbish. They didn't put McDonald on the ballot paper at the pre previous election, did they? They put Corbyn on the ballot paper, them 10 or 11 right wingers that did it, because they wanted Cooper to win, not Burnham. They thought Corbyn would soak up some of Corbyn's votes, and Cooper would win. They're always thinking about, th whatever they're thinking about, I might be right or wrong, but they're not good things for you that they're thinking about. <laughs> and the election results themselves, I've studied the election results, really interesting, it was a city vote. If you look at the election results, Liverpool, three seats, all had a 25,000 majority. Cardiff, for the first time since the 1960s, all the seats went Labour. Le Leeds, for the first time since 1918, all the seats went Labour. Corbyn got a 34,000 Labour majority in London and wasn't in the top six Labour majorities in London. It was a city vote. Newcastle, 25,000 majorities each. It was a city vote. It was, that is where the action is first. That's where, it's, that's where the wind is blowing. It's bad enough being poor in Wakefield, but it's ten times more worse being poor in London. That is the problem. And we've got a situation now where the votes in some of them areas were not as good as they were in the cities. But that's because YouGov said what question came up on the doorstep. And the question on the doorstep was not, can Corp, what, do you like Jeremy Corbyn? The question was, can Labour win? And the right wing were trying to make it look like it was impossible. They were in league with the press, the media, the banks, etc., to make it look like he was unwinnable. And those people on the left who said the reason they hate Corbyn is because he is winnable, they were laughed at by a lot of people. And that's why people were shocked. We've got a situation now. I went to vote on that day, I voted Labour, as I always have done. Three things happened on that day that I think were of great importance. One was 92% of the population voted Tory or Labour. That's the first time since the 1960s that more than 90%. It was a class vote. Those who were not part of that battle, except in Scotland, those who were not part of that battle just got disappeared. The Liberals, the UKIP, they disappeared. And I walked in to vote behind a couple who were old in hands, would have been in the 60s, um, poor, you can tell when people are poor, and they were nervous as hell. They'd never, ever voted before. And they went in, they'd no idea. You, you must have seen them. I've seen a lot of young people being like this. I've never seen older people. I've never voted on my own. It's always been the thing in, that, in the families I've been in. You, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group thing voting. You go and vote Labour, everybody votes Labour together. But these two went up, and they didn't know how to vote. And they just said, oh, they give them a, a paper. And they're walking out. And he said, well, what are you doing? He says, well, have you got me down for Labour? We're Labour, we want the living wage. And that's what the election... I cried in that polling station because to them, it wasn't a matter, is Jeremy Corbyn a revolutionary? Is Jeremy Corbyn a terrorist? 
is Jeremy Corbyn going to get me £8.45 an hour when I can't afford to live? That's the real issue, and that's what they don't want to talk about in Parliament. Thank you. So, that was the election, the background. <coughs> now, I think one thing Corbyn's taught us, and he's taught a lot of people this within the movement, is to keep away from the personal comments. To keep away from that. I think there's a lot of admiration for that. I think that the, the attitude was... Another two weeks, Labour would have won the general election. The problem was no access. As soon as Corbyn had access to the media in that four-week period, we've got to allow that access. It was completely... All this stuff about 80% don't want to vote and no comp. Nobody's interested. People started talking about 70% want nationalisation of the railways, 80% want nationalisation of the energy... Thames Water has got a programme of repairs because it, all its pipes will have run out in the next 50 years. The largest water company in Europe, 15 million people... All its pipes will run out in 50 years, and its current repair programme will take 357 years to mend the leaks. That's what they're faced with. They've abandoned. They're not doing anything. They've abandoned the structure in this country. And if I give you, if you get the chance, go and see Dennis Skinner's film, Nature of the Beast. I don't know if anybody's seen that film yet, but however much you like Dennis, you'll like him more when you've seen that. He's, actually, his four brothers are better than him. If you go and see the film, they're all better. But one of his brothers says to him, and also, when I was growing up, when I was living in school, his elder brother, Graham Skinner, were more famous than Dennis. They didn't raise the rents in Claycross in Derbyshire for 12 years. And he says on the programme, there would have been no council house sales if we'd have frozen rents. Nobody wants the liabilities, they just didn't want to pay the rent. And that's what Labour should have done, should have frozen and cut rents all during that period. And he says to his brother, he says, Dennis is not seen as a left winger in Bolsover. Dennis is seen as what you should be. Straightforward, not drinking with them, not socialising with them, reporting back to your constituents. The problem is the others don't do that. And that is the real issue. That's why they get slaughtered, isn't it? Because they won't, our lot, try and impersonate the rich, whereas we should be opposed to the rich. We've got a situation now where... I read a history the other day about a miner from Wakefield in the 1840s who tried to set up the National Union of Mine Workers and he got victimised for that, for that in the 1840s. And he went to court, and the, he, one of his aims was, after a tragedy where somebody's got killed at the pit, there should be a miner on the inquiry. Somebody who knows about coal mining, etc., etc. And the judge said, you don't know enough about the law. You don't know, a miner can't be on that, they don't know enough about the law. And David Swallow, the miner, said, I've had much, enough of the law, I want some justice. And I think that's the issue, isn't it, about the trade union legislation. We've had enough law to, go, to fill us up to here, but I think we want some justice. And that's what the situation's about. Um, Bob Dylan said, when accused of nicking riffs off B.B. King, the good borrow and the great steal. And I think that's true about ideas. There are no new ideas. A lot of the discussions I've heard today come from that. There are new circumstances, there are new nuances. Life doesn't repeat itself. You know, when Jeremy Corbyn finishes the leader of the Labour Party, he won't be replaced by another 68-year-old. There'll be a debate taking place, about, depending on boundary changes, depending on reselections. But it's about learning and listening about what's going on. Because at the end of the day, in the 1890s, if you read the Tory press about organised people in this country were seen as skilled workers then. Unorganised people were seen as unskilled and not allowed into trade unions. And they formed, the Dockers formed the Transport and Training Workers Union. And in the 1890s, Dockers were seen as ignorant, thick, Irish immigrants who couldn't be organised. That's what they were seen and portrayed as in the media. Because that's what they wanted organised workers to think about them. By the 1950s, they were the most organised, well-paced workers in Britain. And when you think about McDonald's workers, when you think about fast food workers, of which there's massive amounts in this country, they're the same sort of workers. You know, the only difference between a docker and a McDonald's worker is the means of communication. The docker turned up to have his shoulder tapped or not tapped. The McDonald's workers are home on a Sunday morning getting a text whether they've got a... Commitment. That's the only difference. There's no difference in the concrete circumstances about pay, about pensions, about sick pay, about maternity leave. Because nothing changes unless we change society. And that's what Corbyn's about, and that's what we should all be about, changing society. Thank you. Cheers. Well, comrades, um, we're obviously living through very turbulent times. And, of course, the, the subject of uh, 
this uh, event this weekend is, is the Russian Revolution. And for us to understand the question of revolution, what it means, its relevance. And I think one of the key things that we learned is that, uh, paradoxically, that uh, revolutions don't begin at the bottom, revolutions begin at the top. They begin with a split in the ruling class. It was uh, Lenin who said that the, the first condition of revolution is a split in the ruling class. And if you look at uh, on a world scale, you can see that is a, a particular feature of the, of the current uh, time of splits and divisions opening up in this leading layer of society. Starting with uh, perhaps the United States, where uh, Trump is literally at war with a section of the ruling class. He's at war with the State Department. He's attacking the, the secret uh, services. The whole situation is extremely unprecedented. <coughs> And what does it reflect? It reflects the, the turmoil that exists within American society today. The beginnings of, of, of a ferment that's going to have a revolutionary content in the, in the future. The same also applies to, to Britain, where uh, the issue of Brexit has seen the biggest split in the, in the British ruling class that we've seen probably have to go back to the repeal of the Corn Laws in the 1840s. I mean, the ruling class in Britain was quite a clever ruling class. It looked at uh, its, uh, its prospects, not in uh, days and weeks, but in decades and centuries in the past. And of course, uh, where it had differences, it always discussed those differences behind closed doors. It didn't express those differences openly, mainly because of, of a third party, that is the working class, who could listen in. But today we see these uh, splits and divisions in Britain of, uh, are very much in the public uh, domain. And again, they're a reflection of the deep crisis affecting British society at this particular uh, stage. After all, Britain, I would say, was um, one of the most stable countries in Europe. It was certainly the envy of the ruling classes in Europe because they thought this two-party system in Britain created this relative stability for British capitalism. But of course that has now completely vanished. That uh, we could say that Britain is not uh, the most stable, it's the most unstable country in Europe. And this uh, instability is increasing, I would say, by the year, by the month. Very quickly, we'll see how things pan out in the next two or three years. Where the situation is uh, the most serious, I would say, for British capitalism, than at any time, probably for a hundred years. The implications are extremely serious, and the implications for the working class is even more serious. But what we have is a, a regime in crisis. The government is in deep crisis. There's splits and divisions openly in the cabinet. They're stabbing each other in the back. They're jockeying per, for position who could become the next leader of the Tory party. The Tory party is in crisis. I mean, the average age of a member of the Tory party is 72 years of age. You know, most of these people are, are waiting in the, in the departure lounge. <laughs> and that's a reflection of the decay, of, if you like, of, uh, of this party. The representatives of real British capitalism is, in a, de is a mess. And that's a product of the, of, of the past. But also, we see a build-up in Britain of, of, of anti-establishment feeling. 
And the establishment in Britain is very important for the defense of capitalism. And yet every single institution of the establishment is in crisis because of the uh, scandals particularly that have affected each and every sector, whether it be the press, whether it be parliamentary expenses or whatever, one after another have been undermined in the consciousness of working people. If it is a very dangerous position that they face. Of course, um, the uh, position they have now is a very serious one because um, uh, we've got Theresa May as the Prime Minister. And uh, whereas in the past uh, she viewed herself as uh, someone who's very strong and very stable, has now become dialectically, you know, uh, very unstrong, very unstable indeed. And of course, um, she's become a liability. Look how, how the mighty have fallen. You know, a year ago, the Tories were 20% ahead in the opinion polls. She had a personal rating which is far, far higher than Corbyn and so on. And yet, within the space of a matter of a months or weeks, all that was destroyed. And it shows the volatility that is there. But you don't have to wait years for something to happen. Things are happening very, very rapidly at a very increased tempo because of the crisis of capitalism that uh, Britain faces. But she's a liability. The only problem is for the ruling class. Uh, they know they have to get rid of her. George Osborne says she's a, a, de a, a dead man walking or a dead woman walking. She hasn't got much life left. But if they remove her, it means an all-out bloody civil war within the Tory party. Because who's going to take over from Theresa May? That's the big question. And after this uh, inevitable civil war, because she's got to go at some point, it's going to be someone like Boris Johnson. Our foreign uh, uh, minister, you know, Boris the Barbarian, as my brother likes to call him. <laughs> he could end up as the leader of the Tory party. Or even better, Jacob Rees-Mogg. <laughs> now that is a specimen and a half. <laughs> I mean, uh, he's so reactionary, so backward. Uh, he... he uh, in, a, in, a, in a general election, he was taking his nanny to do the canvassing. He stood at the, uh, the gate and sent her to deliver leaflets you know, like on the election. Take his nanny, his maid. <laughs> and he's even known by his friends as the, the right honorable gentleman for the early 18th century. <laughs> Which gives you a bit of an idea of how things lay. But, but this is alarming. I mean... Uh, what, you know, get rid of me, who are you going to have? And therefore there's a, there's a panic, if you like, a serious uh, uh, disquiet within the ruling class of what is the way forward under these circumstances. And uh, the reason why they're alarmed, it's not just the top, but why is this discontent? Well, it's due to the deep economic crisis of British capitalism and the fact that this gives rise to a, a crisis within the working class itself. The 2008 slump of capitalism ushered in an enormous ta attack on the working class in Britain. And this has culminated in the biggest fall in living standards in the last decade, that is real wages, for 200 years. In fact, uh, Last week, Paul Johnson, he's the leader of the Institute of Fiscal Studies in Britain, said that was not quite correct. You have to go back to 1750, the actual birth of the, of the English working class, to see such a comparable collapse in living standards. Now, this is uh, an incredible situation. The reality of working class life has deteriorated enormously. The insecurity that has developed, the fact that young people, in particular, are not going to have a living standards higher than their parents, and maybe even their grandparents. That's the situation that they face. And therefore you have this, this pressure exerted 
You know, we have the flexibility of labor, and that's been brought home with a vengeance in Britain. The zero hour contracts, the short term contracts, the agency work. And agency work, this is more agency work is in Britain than the rest of Europe put together. You know, they're talking about, oh, there's a lot of people in work. Yes, low skilled, low aged work, exploitative work. That's the reality of, of many young people in particular, of a two-tier workforce being introduced to undermine the, the conditions of ordinary working people. And therefore we have to understand the stress that has been caused in, in work. And if you like, even the terror that goes on in work. We look at the example of Sports Direct, which I don't think is uh, an anomaly where they have a big warehouse in the north of England where they introduced the, the scheme th you know, three faults and you're out three misdemeanors and you're out and workers are so afraid of taking time off work that he may, they go to work sick, ill in fact it's, it, it's well known that ambulances been, have been called to the work workplace because people have just collapsed because of illness even at that sorry example, horrific example, where a, 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 a pregnant worker was so terrified of taking paternity leave that she gave birth on the toilet floor of the factory. I mean, that's Britain in the 21st century. That's the reality of life. No wonder there's anger, no wonder there's bitterness that's developed in Britain in the past period because of this crisis that we face even recognized by the ruling class. The Financial Times last week explained, that, I quote, there is a rising sense of grievance and a collapse in trust of the old political order. The march to progress has ended. The present has become a very much darker place. Why endure the hardships and iniquities of the here and now, if the future is still bleaker, it asks. This is, this is uh, I think, powerful stuff. He goes on, however, to say, many Europeans are angry, others fearful. However, I do not sense they want a revolution. As an aside, pass the mustard, please. But the fact that they even have to raise this ire, well, I don't think they're really looking for a revolution, is uh, more indicative of the, of the real situation uh, facing the working class in Europe and Britain at the present uh, moment. All he says was what we need is a, a fairer balance and a sense of main, mainstream politicians are at least on their side. He says that's the way to cure it. Obviously, that, that's not going to happen. And therefore, the working class are going to be further under the cosh in the next period in Britain. So what is it preparing? It is preparing a social explosion. It's like a pressure cooker where the valve is closed down and the heat is turned up. That's the situation in Britain at the present time. And what's it going to be like in the next two or three years? Is there's the the heading of the, the standard of three days ago, Brexit Britain. Things can only get worse. Well, it's going to get, they're going to get a damn sight worse. Because even the bourgeois recognise they're not going to get a deal. It's very unlikely they're going to get a deal in Europe. And they can crash out of the European Union. And that will cause a slump in Britain, which will have effect also in Europe itself. In other words, is it, there's turmoil coming in Britain, big turmoil which is going to change the consciousness of the working class even more in the next period. But this government is hanging by a thread. That Corbyn could easily be pushed into power very, very rapidly in the next uh, period. Of course, we want a Corbyn government. We will fight for a Corbyn government. But we do say it should be on a socialist programme. Why? Because we've learnt their lessons of history. On a capitalist basis, there's no way forward. Capitalism is demanding. 
counter reforms, not reforms. It's not a question of good capitalism and bad capitalism. It's capitalism in crisis and cannot afford any longer the reforms who work in people, they've taken it back. And that's a very important lesson that we have learnt. But the ruling class is terrified of the Labour government. I've got a quote here from the um, Anne McElvoy. She's the editor of The Economist. Labour is about to take an historic step, for a step that will complete its journey from a, left, a centre-left party to one whose precepts are essentially Marxist. They think that the Labour Party, this is, this is the bourgeois, they're terrified that the Labour Party has become more a Marxist party. I wish it was the case. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have a bit of a longer wait to go before that is the case. But it shows how they fear the Labour Party getting into power. And above all, in a context of Britain being forced out of the European Union, crashing out of a world slump developing as well, where all the ammunition has been used up and the Labour government comes to power under those crisis conditions. <coughs> of course, the ruling class are going to be put in pressure. They will blackmail, they will sabotage, they will undermine that Labour government in order to try and get rid of it, or at least make it capitulate and carry out its orders, as they did in Greece with Syriza. They want to do that, maybe. But what they terrified of is that the working class will also put pressure on that Labour government after all those years of iniquity, this build-up of pressure, and Corbyn there, he's the man who's got to carry it out. That'll be the way they'll be pushing it. And there'll be a colossal pressure from the working class itself. And we say that our Labour government must not use the crisis as an excuse in order to water down its ideas and abandon its program, as has been the case in the past, but uses the crisis in order to carry through emergency measures to put an end to capitalism and to carry through a socialist program. That is the only way that this can work out for working people. And that's not a crazy idea. It's not a new idea. It was born after the impact of the Russian Revolution inside the Labour Party when they adopted Clause 4, the Socialist Constitution of the Labour Party, to secure for the workers, by hand or by brain, the full fruits of their industry, based on the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. Those workers wanted to overthrow capitalism. But capitalism was part of the problem. And therefore it should become more of a reality in this period where capitalism is in deep crisis and needs a solution itself. And therefore we say that the Labour government mustn't bend the knee to capital, but on the contrary must go on the offensive against the sabotage, mobilise the working class, and yes, carry out, the, carry out emergency powers to take over 150 monopolies, the banks and insurance companies that dominate 80% of Britain's trade at the present time. And yes, well, should they offer compensation? In the Socialist Appeal, it says no. I think we, should, we can be a bit generous on that. Two weeks ago, you had Monarch Airways, it was the fifth biggest airway in Britain, went into a receivership and they sold it for a pound in order to avoid the pension liabilities, actually. And not so long ago, Sir Philip Green sold off British Home Store's retail outlet also for a pound. So it's the going rate. 150 monopolies, 150 quid. We'll do that. That's no problem. But on the basis of a socialist plan of production, that we can raise the level of the living standards of the working class in this country, as uh, was said by Paul, we can cut the, the work in hours. We can increase living standards. We can abolish poverty, squalor, homelessness, unemployment, which is a product of capitalism itself. And then we make a revolutionary appeal to the workers of Europe and of the world 
as the Bolsheviks did in 1917, to follow our example and establish a socialist United States of Europe and a socialist federation of the world. That's what should be on offer for the working class in Britain and internationally. Because only on the basis of capitalism, it's a nightmare scenario for workers. Whether you're inside or outside the EU, as is pointed out, and then anyway, those people who talk about the single market, the single market, single market means privatization. It means austerity. It means it cuts. It means a tax on working class people. It's not a solution whatsoever. We have to get back to the fundamentals. The Russian Revolution began a world event, really. It wasn't a Russian event. It was a world event 100 years ago. They started it. We must commit ourselves to finishing the task of a world revolution, whether it's in Britain, Europe, or whatever. That's the only outlet for humanity. But the precondition of that is the building of a Marxist tendency from a, a small nucleus to a larger tendency to a mass force in the British labor movement to begin with. So it has the backbone, has the ability, has the willpower to carry through such a revolution as the Bolsheviks did itself. And therefore we ask you, it's the most important factor, the subjective factor. We as individuals can do very little, but together we can change the world. And therefore I say, those who are not members of the International Marxist Tennessee Year or Socialist Appeal should decide to join us to build this Marxist tendency so that we can create the force to overthrow capitalism in Britain and international and start the real history of humankind itself. Thank you, Gomez.